Oh, this is uh, obviously the least enviable keynote, right? Because Andrew's still a good guy because he's still one keynote away from beers and nibbles. So this is always the tricky one. So I'm going to be very punchy. And um, obviously, I've been very punchy with my title as well. Um, because what Andrew was talking about was a lot about the what, right? You're, we're in a room full of incredible people who have a lot of what's in their, in their head, things they want to do, things they want to create. And this is a bit about the how. And it is a how that's in beta, okay? This is a how that is uh, perpetually in development. I'm gonna be shockingly vulnerable in this process because I think that's kind of a fair exchange. You guys have to sit there before uh, we have drinks and chatting and networking. And I think it'd be great to express one way to approach leadership in this space. Um, it's something for me that's quite important because um, uh, I take life very personally. Like, I think one of the worst pieces of advice I hear is when people are like, oh, don't take life so personally. Don't take, really, don't take life for, well, you got one life. <laughs> take it bloody personally, all right? This is like one mortal existent, might as well own it. And the best bit is, I want to own it in a way that I will not be embarrassed by what my kids can Google about me when I'm older. Like, I don't want to be embarrassed by that. I don't want there to be a compartmentalization of how I am at work or how I'm at home. I don't want to be ever embarrassed by that. And, you know, I'm 34. I got a family, uh, two incredible parents, a sister, amazing wife, two kids. And they hold me to account, okay? They hold me to account for all the right reasons. And the reason why is because at the end of the day, they know that it's more about what you do when no one's looking that really matters. And this has been critical, critical to my, um, to my work. I was 22 when I first moved abroad from the States. My parents were immigrants to America. Um, I didn't speak the, the language of the country I went to. I learned it in a month. And I was humbled. I was absolutely humbled because essentially I had to develop a global innovation program from scraps, no money, no talent, no nothing. All I had was a ponytail and a bit of attitude. And the nice thing about that attitude is it led to lots of cock-ups, OK? My, I thought I lost, and was going to lose my job in my first three months. I lost the first company I worked for several million uh, dollars in about five minutes. Uh, that kind of sucked. Uh, and I remember writing my resignation letter. My parents are of Polish descent, and so we do guilt very well. And the thing about guilt is how you write guilt. So I remember writing that uh, resignation letter, and luckily, luckily, uh, I remember calling my parents and saying, look, uh, mom and dad, I think I may have to come home. And I was so embarrassed. Like, like I'd gone to school, I'd been pre-med, I'd been chemical engineering, cognitive science, and, uh, and the funny thing was, is actually I, uh, I was given a second chance. And that second chance had been absolutely critical because the guy was like, no, 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 you just lost me a bunch of money. You got a year to make 10 times of that back. And that was the bar that was set. And I realized, yeah, I can't, I can't run away from this. I have to actually, I need to own this. And that's why it was perfect for R&D. So I ran a global R&D program, uh, six continents, and essentially uh, traveled a lot of the world and, and, and learned a lot in a very short period of time and um, won a couple of awards, and then I was essentially burnt out at the age of 26. And I was like, you know, my dad's bald. I've kept enough of my hair to be quite proud. I'm fighting, fighting it, but I was losing my hair a little too quickly. I was getting old before my time, and uh, I rebooted. I went back to school, thankfully because of my girlfriend, now my wife. She was braver than I. I didn't have a place at a school like here. Um, I hadn't applied, hadn't done a GMAT. And uh, I went to Cambridge, and it absolutely flipped my life. And the reason why I flipped my life is I went there, and I was the golden boy. I'd done cool shit. I, I traveled the world. I won awards. So I walked in there sizing everyone up, because I was like, yeah, sorry, I'm just going to let you guys notice that I'm the golden boy. Anyone? And all of a sudden, about three weeks later, totally my confidence was undermined, because I was really like, oh my god, you guys have done really cool stuff. I've not done anything. And then you realize a great insight, which is you are always the extra in the movie of the other person, in their head. You are just an extra, all right? And it is a humbling moment. You have to actually unwire yourself. You have to remember that you got, all these people are doing amazing things. And if you allow yourself to do that, you get to be a sponge. So that took me three weeks. And I unpacked this, and I was just like, oh my god, I haven't done, I haven't done it. I haven't done it, barely anything. And I let myself, for that year, just reforge myself and just sponge off the things I can't do that I'm not good at. And not try to emulate it, but more importantly, hunt it out later in the talent I wanted to work with. 
So then uh, I got my first and so far only um, job rejection, which is ironic because I actually won this client in the room I got rejected in, in Canary Wharf. How cool is that to come full circle? I was like, we just got this pitch signed off and I just like, I think I got rejected here. And that was a place and I was just like, this is nice, come full circle, now I can serve, serve this client. And then um, joined Saatchi and Saatchi. I think I was the first chemical engineer ever hired at Saatchi and Saatchi. They took me, threw me absolutely into the deep end. Um, I was completely unqualified for the gig. I spent four and a half years there. I was the first member of both the creative and strategy board, and it, it exposed me to 60-some brands in about four and a half years, and I just threw myself in, absolutely threw myself in. Didn't know how the rules worked, never seen Mad Men, didn't know nothing. And I just went in there, and I'm just like, I know an idea. I, 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 can, I can smell ideas. That's what I'm good at. When I pick up ideas and I put people around those ideas, that's when I shine, and that's when I got obsessed with how brands were built. I hated the top-down model, I like the democratization of media and ideas. I'm fascinated by that. And I think we're inherently social beings, which is why I focus now on my company, Free Mavens, on advocacy from the ground up. I'm obsessed with um, advocacy that essentially creates better innovative exchange between customers, brands, and tech. That's what inspires me. So we go from bottom up, none of this top heavy media stuff. We use Maven mapping, which are proprietary tech, and we find centers of influence and insights and put that straight into the creative briefs and build brands from the bottom up. Because guess what? That's what we want. 50 years ago when TV started over, blah, 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 blah. How many of you love Sky Plus because you don't have to watch ads? Oh. How many love seeing how close you can get to zero seconds on the skip ad on YouTube? I'm like, I am the fastest skip adder, I think, in London. I'm willing to challenge anyone. And the reason why is because that doesn't make the world a better place. Great brands, great technology, those stories are what makes the world a better place, and that's why we started Free Mavens. We're only 14 and a half months old, so we're in that weird growing pains period of our journey. So a lot of this is inspired from that. I've been in big corporates, I've done the thing, and now I'm doing my own thing. And you guys are going to do your own thing. So now to the nitty gritty. Um, your turn uh, from theory to practice. This is the Cabo de San Vincent. Why is it important? Because this is where Henry the Navigator trained Vasco da Gama and Christopher Columbus. You guys have been in the harbor. Now you gotta go out. And that's where you go out to. That's not the most, I mean, talk about thrown into the deep end. It's like you're in a lovely harbor in the southwest coast of Portugal and then big fucking waves. <laughs> big waves, big cliffs, big danger. And the nice bit about this is I know more now than I've in years past of who I'm not. I'm not nearly as famous or wealthy or scale of success of these guys, but there's a lot of traits of these guys I definitely do not have. Jack Welch, definitely not. Steve Jobs, definitely not. Richard Branson, Wolf of Wall Street. Why? Because you, I love the guys. When the biography of Steve Jobs came out, I loved how everyone in shortage was like, and it was like the one book people didn't get on the iPad they're like, I'm, I'm reading Jobs biography. <laughs> Do you know, you have your, oh yeah, I got a Mac, and this is my second iPad. And you go, and I love these guys because you meet them and you talk with them. They'd be like, oh, Steve Jobs, he was amazing. He was so amazing. And I'm like, did you read the same book I read? Because I read them like, asshole, 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 tons of failures, lost a lot of people's money, asshole, 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 asshole. Ooh, good idea, iPod, all right. And then boom, you know, his whole life changed. And I'm just like, if you're using that as a handbook for leadership, oh my God, okay? And the problem is, is there is actually a secret to this. The secret is this. I hate to tell you this. Most of you guys already know this. If you want to be successful, if you want to be awesome, if you want to make tons of money, uh, essentially there is one fail-proof way to do this, be an asshole. It's true. You will only be successful in business, nothing else. You're, the rest of your life will be in ruins. But you will do this, will work. It still works. There's tons of, uh, talk to me at networking. I'll point you in the direction of all the industries and categories. This still very much works. Be an asshole, get promoted. Be an asshole a bit more, get promoted. Get more rich. Not necessarily happier, but it still works. And I don't like that. I don't like it because it's, it's not the way I was raised. And the thing is, is there was one good quote in the book that I love, and it's this one, which was, making an enduring company is both far harder and far more important than making an enduring product. And that's what I want to do. And I imagine most of you want to do that. You have an idea in your head, and it's not necessarily the what you want to make, it's how you want to do it that's interesting. So, it's gonna be very, very punchy. The world's less linear. That's the only thing that's changed, in my opinion, in the last uh, 10, 15 years. Everyone talks about, oh, we've changed this, it's the internet, da, da, da. I'm like, no. The only difference is far less linear world. 
all right? And that means a new wave of leadership is required. There's a reason why men have dominated leadership, because we are linear thinkers, all right? Men in the room, and I see there's a good balance, but still more men in the room. I hate to tell you, our days are numbered. <laughs> and the reason why our days are numbered is women are is proven to be better systems thinker. One of the few differences shown between the genders, and they are, can manage multiple variable sets, all right? And this is great for creativity. Guys will have to learn, learn to go A to B, B to C, A to C. Like that is the extent of male problem solving. <laughs> and that is very, very dangerous for the world we have in front of us. We have very nonlinear problems ahead of us. We have these types of problems. And this was the easy diagram I found on Google, okay? That is the joy of this. So, dark look into my soul. I can't believe I chose the dark, the dark image. And I just realized that. I didn't plan that. Now I think about that. Uh, that was, that's bad art direction, Joe. Uh, bad art direction, Joe. Uh, look into my soul. Um, so this is where I got to hyper, hyper vulnerable because I think it's a very important aspect of leadership today that we have to have a, there's a golden rule, which is if I, if I show you some vulnerability, the likelihood that you'll beat me up is a lot lower. All right, okay? So, Number one, egotistical motivation that drives me as a leader, fundamentally, down to my DNA, is I want to be loved by my team, okay? I want to be loved by my team, but this is the irony, I want to be loved by them loving what they do. That is the thing that drives me. It drives my ego, it drives my ambition, and the reason I state it so openly to you is because if you do not have this in your mindset of what drives you, it will blindside you later on. You have to be utterly honest with yourself. So everything you're gonna see after this is biased by that ego. You've just got a sense of the size of my ego by that statement. I want to be loved by my team, fundamentally. That's why I tick. So seven ideas on creative leadership. Three buckets, mindset, kind of attitudinal, context of the environment you keep around you, and last, a bit about purpose. So the first one, my, uh, my wife thinks that when I finally write my book, um, she's going to get a, a, a quite a bit of my, um, my royalties because she coined this phrase, FHS. It came from a uh, disagreement we had uh, in the early days of our dating where my FHS, which stands for effing high standards, okay, um, I used it giving her very poor advice on dealing with someone she was having trouble with. And I was like, nye, 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 nye. and she went into this and it totally blew up, all right? And she came into the room and she went, you and your FHS, all right? And so two days later, when I'm still trying to work my way back, I go, look, I, I'm, I'm sorry about my FHS. And she goes, you know what? I love you for your FHS. I love it when it's applied at work, not home. And I was like, that's actually when I'm good. When I have FHS, and this is at Free Mavens, we have FHS. And the reason why FHS is important, it's not about you. The idea sits in the middle. Did it reach FHS? Yes or no? No. Why? Do we run out of time? Do we have not enough money? Do we have enough energy? Why is it not FHS? And the reason, what that does is it puts the idea in the center of the table. It is bigger than you. The legacy of the idea is in the team, not in an individual. And that is what FHS protects you from. I love it when the team talks about FHS, when they go, is this FHS? Do we do FHS? And it's the one thing that it's brutal honesty. Is that the best idea we could have done with resources and time? And if the answer is no, understand why not. Second thing, empathy. It's amazing. This is Paul Ekman's six photographs, right? He took this to a tribe in Java, uh, one of the Java Islands. And uh, the amazing thing was these people had no exposure to media and they knew exactly what emotions were being shown, all right? Human, in our wiring is the need to be empathetic, and I think that what drives this for creative leadership is you have to have unending, no tiredness, curiosity in the human spirit. Tomorrow, good exercise. Go into your local cash and carry, find the most esoteric magazine you can find on that news rack and buy it. All right? It's going to be something about railways or like quilting. Okay? And the reason why you're going to buy this is that magazine's surviving. You guys don't even have a business. They have a business. And guess what? It's based on quilts. And the reason why you're going to read that is empathy, is that a great creative leader, and this is the most exhausting part of my job and the most exhausting part of the team's job, is you actually live the life of thousands of people every day. You have such a heightened sense of empathy that you literally understand 
their headaches, their anxieties, their ambitions. And the way you test this and forge this is by throwing yourself into passion points that make no sense to you, like quilting or model railroads, kite team. Those types of things I read, and I every so often buy a random magazine, and I just go, this is surviving. People love this. Why? What drives them? Why is this a good use of their time? Third, choices versus commitments. I hate the word commitment. Absolutely hate it. That's my two kids, Tom and Wewo. I go home nearly every Wednesday at 3 o'clock to pick them up from schools. Do you know how mental that is with a startup? All right, it is that, it's ridiculous. All right, but I'm committed. No, I realize I wasn't committed. It sounds like a word I hate, which is committee as well. Now, why is commitment bad as a word? Great creative leaders, they never get that mistaken with choices. Commitments is asking for a pity party. I'm com I got a commitment. I'm, oh, I'm committed to my wife. No, I choose to be loyal to my wife. I choose to dedicate time to my kids. I choose it. I tell my wife, she didn't like this at first, but then she liked it once I explained it. I was just like, I mean, I'm not committed to you. I choose. I choose to be loyal. And I find that that takes you away from pity because it's hard being a leader, right? And you go, oh, I can't believe I'm committed to that client. Oh, God. And no, it's not commitment. You chose this path. This was not an accident. It was not thrust upon you. You chose it. Never get those two things mixed up. Aren't they cute? <laughs> They're good mental boys, I tell you. Absolutely mental. Context. This is about the environment you work in. Um, this is probably the hardest bit to scale. So if you guys go absolutely mental with one of your ideas, the easiest thing to lose is culture. So row versus flow. Row is about results only work environment, right? It is about letting being accountable. Millennials will absolutely love this about you. If you give them a chance to own the results, you will win. But the balance is flow, which is that sense of well being. We put a lot of play into our office, not because it's cool and that's what you do in advertising agencies, it's actually great for creativity. It breaks up the results with play, it breaks up the mind. Failure. I'm not going to tell you about the two phalluses up in the right-hand quadrant because we accidentally sent those to a client. <laughs> and the key thing about failure is allowing your best people to, there's a Portuguese word for it, desenrescado, it means to un-F oneself. I love that there's a verb for that, which is you've got to give people the chance to unpick their failures. This was a one that was absolutely saved at the last minute, thankfully, to a slow broadband connection. And we got it. It's now known as Cockgate in the office, and it's been an important part of understanding failure in a, in a company. Three very simple maxims to take away with you. If you don't know what you're doing, you haven't paid any attention to this point, just remember these three things, okay? Which is one, remember it's we versus me. That's the number one thing. If you do the first bit, the second bit comes easy. No one takes credit for um, ideas in Free Mavens because everyone knows how the ideas evolve. They know the story of the we first before the me. Second thing is how versus what. Don't get those mixed up. If you get the how right, normally the what sorts itself out. It's how you do things. It's not the end to justify the means. And lastly, substance versus style. I've met some of you. You guys have startups. You have great ideas. And often I'll sit there and I go style, 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 ooh, a little bit of substance, style, style, style. Like I will never be impressed by a PowerPoint template. I'll never be impressed by a trifold board or your little mock-up. I will get impressed by the substance of your idea. That is what I will fight and sweat and bleed for. All right? Not the what, the how, the substance, not the style. And I like the we versus the me. And then lastly, create a forge. Free mavens, uh, you got to forge these behaviors. They never, it never, never ends. And to prove this point, I'm actually going to invite down three free mavens. And I even, don't even know what they're going to say. And uh, I'm slightly running over time, but I think you should actually hear from them because I have no idea what they're going to say, so I'm as curious as you. Because they're experiencing this right now. They are being forged. And what I mean by forged is you've got to have a mechanism where you yourself can unlock the greatness of yourself by unlocking it in others first. And that takes a partnership. So without further ado, I'll let Joe, Anne, and Anton um, talk a little bit about the forge and a little bit about Free Mavens and whatever they want to talk about.
assumed at some point it would get easy and that I would know enough and I would learn enough that the sort of overwhelming fear that I felt every day would go and it never has. And <laughs> I think I look at Chris and Onje and see that they are challenged every day, sometimes on an hourly, minutely basis, and they're very transparent about that. And the kind of the conscious about that is that you're we're all always exhausted because it's really hard to take on that much information every day. Uh, it's very emotionally draining because we're working with such a small team of people you care about and you don't want to let down and yet you want to stay up all the time. But the, the pros are that you get to do a job that you really love and that it's you kind of get comfort in the fact that you've worked it out enough times and then sort of today our challenge was coming up on Tuesday when we <laughs> have done this before um, and tomorrow there'll be something equally hard. I think, yeah, I mean, the room what Anne said. Um, that being said, it's so important to just jump in. I mean, it's all scary. Everyone has the same feeling from a, an empathy level. You've just got to jump in. Yeah. Head first, without snorkel, <laughs> start flapping around. <laughs> um, I think the, um, the biggest thing I learned from, from Monja and Chris is that they never had a blueprint to be free havens or a uh, kind of guide to how to make a great company or how to um, kind of, there's no box ticking to their job. So, you know, what's a success for them in two or four years? They didn't know. So they kind of pushed that on us as well. And we don't have boxes that we need to tick. Um, I'm not going to be a middle account manager in a year's time and an account director in four years' time. And there's no linear path like that. I learned by doing every day, making mistakes, being encouraged and um, really, you only stop yourself, but you'll never get stopped by a, a kind of what you think your job should be, or following the blueprint, or ticking boxes. It's just about learning and doing. Hey. Hi. So I'll fast forward to the end. Um, what are some of the risks before I take any questions? Um, some of the risks, and some of you guys are going to know this, like. Um, Leadership is shockingly lonely. It is really lonely at times. And you're, you feel quite, you feel burdened. And the thing about it is your head keeps on telling you because you know you're in a movie and you're, my, you're all my extras. And I'm thinking, oh, this is the moment where the music, the dramatic music swells because look at the burden on his shoulders. And then you realize, now that, I chose this again. This is, this is my choice. And it is going to sometimes be lonely. Like, you know, there's a gag about, you know, vegans, you know, you, you, you don't eat any good food, but you always have the moral high ground. Like, I'm a little bit smug at times at the jerks and asshole. I go, I'm going to be smarter than you. I'm going to be better. I'm going to be more tenacious. I want, I want to win in a way that I think is better for everyone. You know, I want a place where people, a better version of themselves, come out. Second thing is, the hardest part about this gig in creative leadership is you'll spend so much of your time hiring, but my God, you'll spend all the time firing because people will not want to leave if you create this environment. They won't want to leave. And some of the mature ones will like, they'll get their way out. They'll kind of know. But the others won't. So be ready to fire people as well. Your own bullshit. Now, I am lovingly surrounded by an incredible family. My mom and dad, my sister, her husband, my wife, my friends, my kids. And um, I have people outside who call me on it. And you have to build this, because if you don't do it from the very beginning, you'll get it way too late. People who will actually know your, the way you're wired and unpick it so they can actually say to you, you're not being you. You're not being you. And it has to be outside of your work environment. And you have to be dedicated to this. You have to schedule it in. You'll always try to belittle that time. It is critical, or you'll drink your own Kool-Aid. All right? I'm very, very lucky that I'm surrounded by people who every so often they'll just pull me aside and they go, Andre, remember all that stuff you talk about? Can you go, go do that? You're really good at talking about it. Go do it. I know you can. Just go do it. And the last bit is it's building a cathedral. It never, ever ends. Ever, 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 ever. Remember, this is a choice, not a commitment. So thank you very much for your time. Um, it's been uh, obviously a pleasure to wrap up the day, and I'll take any questions you have.